So for sure, I would like again uh, to thank uh, Technion for awarding me and my colleagues, Jennifer Donna and Fang Zhang, the prestigious Harvey Prize. So it's, it's a great honor, and I'm very happy always to be in Israel. You, you can always invite, in, invite me again. <laughs> <laughs> well, having said this, I was very excited because I was thinking that it would be warm and, and here now I find myself in a room and <laughs> it's very cold. So, <laughs> um, having said this, I would like to thank the organizers for putting together this uh, symposium. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, very nice to have the opportunity to always remind uh, those who may not know that uh, Chris Parkas originally is a bacterial immune system and uh, I always enjoy uh, repeating <laughs> some of the, of the basics of, of CRISPR, which uh, I think uh, uh, are really important for you to, to know and to not uh, forget, uh, specifically that it comes from basic research, uh, working on bacteria and asking questions, which maybe originally people would find not that much of interest, and yet, uh, when one works on bacteria and viruses, one always knows that one can find interesting mechanisms, some of which can be harnessed for molecular biology and genetic purposes, as uh, the history has shown us. Um, so I would uh, also start briefly with uh, the acknowledgement. So uh, this uh, CRISPR journey started for me in uh, Austria. Uh, the main work was done during my move from Austria to Sweden and then in Sweden. And then in 2013, I moved to, to Germany. Having said this, uh, for sure, behind this work, you have uh, uh, talented uh, young students and, and postdocs with whom I have had the pleasure to work with, and collaborators. And I would like to cite uh, the group of Jörg Vogel in Germany, the group surely of Jennifer uh, Darna with Martin Yinek, and the group of Eugenie Kunin, as well as a group of David Weiss for a story that uh, we have published recently. Um, with regard to the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, so as you know, it's a, it's a very powerful technology. Uh, biologists around the world are happy to have uh, an additional uh, tool that uh, allows them to have the possibility to do more precise gene surgery on their cells and organisms of interest. And this is this technology here that is represented as programmable uh, scissors uh, with Cas9 represented in blue as a shape of scissors that can be uh, programmed by an RNA molecule that is in nature two RNA molecules. I mean, in certain applications, the two RNA molecules are also used independently. And this RNA molecule will guide Cas9 to a certain sequence of interest on the DNA, and the DNA will be cleaved by uh, Cas9, uh, owing the, the, the fact that there will be a short uh, nucleotide stretch that is called the protospacer adjacent motif, and that will be uh, located uh, downstream of, of the sequence on the DNA that is recognized by uh, this uh, RNA molecule. And then Cas9 will introduce uh, a break on the DNA and uh, the rest will be done by, by the cells uh, that will repair this break uh, according to the, to the repair pathways available in the cell and also according to the way uh, Cas9 is engineered and then will lead to different types of, of modifications. Having said this, uh, the main Cas9 that is used uh, around the world is uh, the Cas9 originating from strepagenes and it has been quite popular because uh, it uh, allows to cleave uh, the DNA of, of taking into account sequences that are located upstream of a palm that is a short stretch of nucleotides composed of NGG. And one can find a number of NGGs on the genome. So this has been also the reason why uh, Spargenes Cas9 has been successful, independent of the fact that it's also a very efficient enzyme. Now you have large... Um, diversities of, of CRISPR-Cas system that uh, have been developed along the way uh, based on the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system and based on other systems. And I'm sure that you will hear uh, this today uh, with the talks of, of my colleagues and specifically the talk of, of Fang who will focus more on the applications. So the, the ability to, 
to modify uh, genes and genomes is uh, now something that uh, biologists can do over since 50, uh, 60 years, but I'd like to, to remind uh, everyone that it has been also a long way to come to uh, this uh, genetic modification. So uh, the, the 19th century was really uh, the witness of, of the establishment of, of diverse rules uh, with regard to, to genetics and uh, the DNA that was isolated in 1871 and one needed to wait 80 years uh, in the mid-50s uh, of the last uh, century and to have scientists showing that DNA was a carrier of genetic information. Uh, the establishment and uh, the d determination of the structure of the double helix of DNA and the geti genetic code that was revealed in 1966. And then thanks to actually work done on bacteria and viruses, and specifically understanding how bacteria defend themselves against viruses, and a number of uh, enzymes were discovered, so including restriction enzymes and other types of enzymes that would allow to recombine the DNA, and then the ability to sequence the DNA, to amplify the DNA, RNA interference, cloning of DNA, and then with regard to really gene editing, that is the possibility to edit uh, more precisely, uh, genes and, and genomes. Uh, engineered nucleases, here are just uh, two mentioned on this slide, uh, came uh, to, the, to the market and with uh, zinc finger nucleases and talon nucleases, allowing to, to actually perform the types of, of modification, at least at the first uh, basic level, that uh, what CRISPR does. However, a more cumbersome way to, to engineer those nucleases to recognize a certain sequence of, of interest. So there was really a need of a, of a fast and easy tool to use. Uh, there are always needs for better genetic tools, even though CRISPR-Cas9 is helping a lot. And this is when CRISPR came uh, on the way. So, uh, and it has been very popular thanks to the RNA programmability of the system. Uh, so whereby uh, the manipulator just needs to, to design this RNA molecule according to the sequence of, of DNA to be modified. So CRISPR is originally a, a system existing in bacteria and archaea. Not every bacterial cells and archaeal cells have the, the CRISPR-Cas system. Um, maybe 50-60% of the bacteria have CRISPR and 90% uh, of the archaeal cells uh, carries this uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, loci on their genome. And CRISPR stands for clustered, regularly interspaced palindromic repeats, and Cas for CRISPR-associated. So it, it's really to be seen in the context of the arms race between bacteria and viruses and other types of mobile genetic elements, uh, type also plasmids, whereby these mobile genetic elements can attack uh, the bacteria that are here considered as host, also archaea. And they are important for the, for the fitness of, of the prokaryotes because they can bring interesting genes such as virulence genes or antibiotic resistance genes or genes important for the fitness of the bacteria. And with regard to the, to the viruses, and you see this on the bottom of the picture, if the viruses of bacteria called bacteriophages enter the lysogenic cycle, so uh, they, this uh, cycle allows um, the the genome of, of the virus to integrate itself into the genome of the bacteria and brings these new traits, so different characteristics which uh, the bacteria can, can acquire and that will be propagated uh, upon uh, cell division. And the phages can also enter the lytic cycle and, and thereby uh, produce phage particles that will kill the bacterial cells and propagate to kill other bacterial cells. So for all these types of, of interaction, there is always a need for, for the host uh, that will be uh, attacked to, in a way, uh, fight uh, the invader. So sometimes there is an advantage for, for the bacteria to acquire those invad invaders, and sometimes the, the advantage is, is not present. So the bacteria have evolved different um, defense systems that are mostly uh, considered as innate uh, immunity uh, systems. And CRISPR-Cas being um, the first and, and so far only proven system to be an adaptive uh, immune system. Uh, adaptive because it requires the first step of recognition of the phage, 
uh, to have after the machinery uh, triggered to be able to recognize the phage upon a, a second infection. And this uh, is possible thanks to this uh, CRISPR-Cas machinery uh, that is composed of, of proteins and, and uh, RNA molecules. Uh, so, a, a brief history, and I'm sorry for all my colleagues that I will uh, uh, not have the, the possibility to, to cite. I, I just mentioned this because CRISPR, it's, it's not, uh, um, let's put it that way, it, uh, for sure it involved the past research involving uh, bioinformaticians and, and biologists. Uh, so, going back into the history, 32 years ago in 1987, a Japanese group uh, discovered uh, repeats, a series of repeats in the genome of E. coli. So they just described these repeats not knowing what will be the role of those repeats. At the end of the 90s and beginning of 2000s, what was shown is that uh, this uh, series of repeats can be transcribed into a very long precursor CRISPR RNA molecule and that most likely this precursor CRISPR RNA molecule will be processed. Uh, the reason why they came to this hypothesis is because uh, doing a northern blot analysis, they figured out that these repeats were transcribed into RNA molecules of different sizes. So they hypothesized that there will be processing involved. Uh, then in the beginning of 2000s, a number of bioinformaticians, and so there was also uh, uh, the work of, of uh, biologists such as Morika and bioinformaticians including uh, Eugenie Kunin who found out that, and other bioinformaticians, who found out that uh, these uh, repeats uh, were interspaced by unique sequences called spacers that uh, add as origin mobile genetic element uh, sequences. So for some of the spacers, one could not find a match. And for most of the, of the spacers, uh, one could figure out that uh, the sequences were matching sequences of phages, plasmids, or, or transposons. And then in the vicinity of these repeats interspaced by these spacer uh, short sequences, there will be a, a series of, of genes organized as, uh, as an operon uh, that uh, was ultimately called the CRISPR-associated genes, encoding the CRISPR-associated uh, proteins. And so then uh, the hypothesis came that this series of repeats interspaced by the spacers will be transcribed as a long CRISPR RNA molecule that will undergo processing, most likely with the involvement of one of these CRISPR-associated proteins taking the role as RNAs, cleaving the long precursor CRISPR RNA molecule, and that these CRISPR RNAs, uh, each mature form of, of the single CRISPR RNAs, each composed of a portion of the repeat and a portion of the spacer, will guide uh, another set of CRISPR-associated proteins to the invading uh, genome of the phage, and by base pair complementarity between the mark of the spacer that recognizes a, a specific mobile genetic element and the invader, uh, so the genetic element that should be targeted by the CRISPR RNA, you will have uh, a Cas protein uh, that will uh, take the role to uh, affect by uh, cleavage uh, the, the genome invader, and that uh, this will be the end uh, for uh, the, the, the replication of, of the phage. So this idea that CRISPR-Cas will be an RNA-based prokaryotic immune system by analogy to the eukaryotic uh, immune, um, immunity, so RNA interference uh, with uh, the small interfering RNAs and, and uh, the macro-RNAs. A key paper was also published in, in the course of 2007, uh, where the group of, of uh, Sylvain Moineau and Philippe Horvath with Rodolf Barangou uh, showed that actually indeed CRISPR-Cas was an adaptive immune system. So they were working on, on bacteria called uh, Streptococcus uh, thermophilus that are used to, to produce uh, yogurts. And they had an interest in uh, engineering in a natural fashion uh, bacteria, Streptococcus thermophilus, and also uh, Lactococcus or Lactobacillus, that will be resistant to phage infection, which is important for yogurt production. And so what they did is that they took uh, uh, strains of, of bacteria that uh, contained the, the CRISPR systems, and they challenged these bacteria with phages, and they 
figured out that they could actually select for resistant bacteria and that concomitantly to the resistant there was acquisition of a sequence of the phage that was used for, for, the, for the challenge, an acquisition of a sequence of the phage into the CRISPR array as a spacer. So there was an acquisition of an immunizing spacer and that these bacteria will then uh, um, become immune to reinfection. So this was a proof that it was an adaptive immune system. Interestingly, in this bacterium, there were three CRISPR loci, including the CRISPR-Cas9 system. In 2008, uh, the group of, of John van der Oost with, um, with Stan Brands uh, showed that in a certain type of, of CRISPR-Cas, because CRISPR-Cas has largely evolved, and I will show it to you later, uh, a complex of CRISPR-associated uh, proteins can be guided by this um, CRISPR RNA molecule uh, to target the invading genome, and that one uh, protein will uh, target the DNA and cleave the DNA. And uh, concomitantly, the group of, of uh, Marafini and, um, and Sontimer so showed that uh, and then they showed more precisely in the type 3 system that DNA was, for those systems, really the target of, of CRISPR. Um, having said this, uh, for sure, a number of scientists started to, to work on, uh, on, on CRISPR. And what was interesting for this field of research is that it brought together microbiologists, biologists interested in um, RNA molecules, biologists interested in... Uh, in bacteriophages and also structural biologists who try to really understand uh, physiologically speaking and also at the mechanism level how those uh, CRISPR-Cas systems are, are working. Uh, from my side, I, I came to this uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, system through uh, my long-term interest in working with bacterial human pathogens. So mostly uh, so-called gram-positive human pathogens. And at the time, my lab was mostly focusing on streptococcus pathogens. We were also working on, on listeria, but mainly on streptococcus pathogens. So here you see the cocci of streptococcus pathogens. So these are small cocci that can aggregate with one another, form chains. And that they can, uh, so they are highlighted in red for the purpose of the picture. And they can, in this case, invade uh, uh, human pharyngeal epithelial cells and then ultimately uh, cause uh, diseases. 30% of us are also colonized with streptococcus pathogenes without developing disease. But in principle, it's really a strict human pathogen. And surely we are interested in the laboratory because we don't work only on CRISPR in different aspects of uh, understanding how bacteria uh, uh, can um, bring together this uh, different a machinery of, of regulation of, of gene expression at the RNA level and protein level to ultimately produce uh, factors that are important for the bacteria to either cause diseases or survive in the host and specifically adapt to the different uh, changes of, of the environment and stress. And amongst the interaction that bacteria encounter, there are for sure also the mobile genetic elements. So we started on this project because we were interested in working on, on small RNAs. What was known uh, at, at the time, at the beginning of 2000s, and surely for those who are working on, on regulatory RNAs or small interfering RNAs, I always remind that the, the first role of small RNAs as uh, antisense RNAs was shown in bacteria for the control of plasmid replication. But what was shown at, at that point is that in bacteria, actually, small RNAs can interact with messenger RNA and proteins at different levels, and they can really, um, how do you say, use a large uh, diversity of mechanisms to modulate gene expression. So they can interact with messenger RNAs as antisense to activate or inhibit translation or to also uh, affect the stability of the messenger RNA. And they can also, you have some examples of small RNAs that can interact directly with proteins to activate or sequester them from their functions. What was not shown at the time is small RNAs that will interact directly with DNAs to change the fate of the DNA. And this is really what this uh, CRISPR RNAs uh, brought um, with a large diversity of, of mechanisms with regard to the Cas proteins uh, involved and, and the targeting of, of the invading genomes. Uh, so in 2006-2007, and actually uh, this picture was like the picture that comes later was actually the, f the first uh, 
um, slides that uh, we presented at, uh, at, at a European consortium that took place in Ein Gedi because the, for me to, to work on CRISPR was not through, actually I should say this, not through a funding, uh, wishing to work on CRISPR because most likely I would not have received funding, but a funding wishing to understand small regulatory RNAs in bacteria and I was part of European consortium uh, with teams in, in Israel and there was a meeting um, organized in Ein Gedi and this is where we presented the first work, but at that time the direction was not uh, the direction that <laughs> ended up to be uh, understanding what uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is. So at the time we were showing that uh, we had started to, to um, identify the number of, of new small RNAs. We were working on some small RNAs in the lab, but new small RNAs. And one that was interesting for us because it was very well expressed and ultimately now it's known as tracer RNA. And what was also important in, for this stress RNA, so you see the northern blot on the top right of, of the picture, so an expression, uh, constitutive and high expression throughout growth with three forms of, of, the, of this RNA that is now called stressor RNA. And the fact that this stress RNA, so represented in green on the left, is encoded by a sequence of DNA located upstream of the gene that was already at the time annotated by bioinformaticians as um, a gene that would encode a CRISPR-associated protein of Streptococcus thermophilus, and that this protein will contain two nuclease domains, RUFC-like nuclease and HNH-like nuclease, and that uh, this protein uh, had actually different names, so it, it was known as CSN1, uh, CSX12, and, and Cas5, and ultimately, uh, the nomenclature uh, decided on, on Cas9 in, in 2012. So, but at the time when we started to work on the, on the protein, for us it was CSN1. So we could map uh, this uh, RNA molecule, and initially we were actually also uh, interested in CRISPR because we had understood that this was possibly uh, a niche uh, to really have uh, an exciting uh, findings on a class of of RNA molecules that seem to be um, extremely particular. So we decided also to, to start our work on, on CRISPR. Um, having said this, the chance we had us is that in the strand of Streptococcus pargenes we were working with, we had two CRISPR loci, one of, of type one origin and one of type two origin. The type two origin is Cas9. So this is just to show you that for those who may think that CRISPR-Cas is only CRISPR-Cas9, so by now you may have also realized that uh, other types of CRISPR systems other than Cas9 uh, are also developed for um, um, genetic uh, uh, engineering. But having said this, what is really uh, remarkable in this system is that it has largely evolved. And this slide represents uh, the six types uh, which uh, have been described in 2015. There is a, a new nomenclature with more subtypes of, of those types that uh, will be published soon. Uh, when we started to work on, on, uh, on CRISPR-Cas and up to 2015, the type 1, type 3, type 4 and type 2 that are on the top of, of these slides were described. And most of my colleagues were working on the mechanisms of type 1 and type 3. Uh, even though for the type 2, what was clear from the work of Orvarts, Moineau and Barangou is that there will be only one protein involved uh, for the type of interference, uh, so in the middle of, of the slide, to really interact with the invading genomes, whereas for type 1 and type 3 systems, you would have a complex of CRISPR-associated proteins involved. So the dogma of CRISPR at the time was that there is a single CRISPR RNA molecule uh, following maturation that will guide this complex of CRISPR-associated proteins to the invading genome, and one Cas protein will cleave uh, the genome, and it was not clear at the time whether it would be DNA or RNA, even though, as I said, some groups had, had shown that, okay, it would be the DNA for some of, of the types. What was important as well is to mention that at the level of the processing, of the CRISPR RNAs that also a CRISPR associated protein will be involved. And indeed, this was shown uh, by the groups I mentioned before, including also the group of Michael Turns, that will be that Cas6 protein that is on the left of this uh, picture is an endoribonuclease, which for the type 
for the types one and three of CRISPR-Cas systems will uh, have the role to maturate uh, these uh, CRISPR RNAs. What was clear is that the type two will be different because there will be only one protein instead of this complex of CRISPR-associated proteins and that the Cas6 enzyme was also missing. So we started to, to ask ourselves what could be the mechanism for this type two system uh, importantly, we were also uh, aware of the fact that there is this uh, RNA molecule, tracer RNA, encoded uh, so upstream of, of, uh, of the gene uh, that um, codes for this uh, Cas9 protein. And initially, we were going in a total different uh, direction with this tracer RNA. We had found a messenger RNA target coding for a virulence factor, so we saw that this tracer RNA would have a role in virulence. Ultimately, we showed it in another bacterial species than S. pyogenes, but having difficulties to really show the role of tracer RNA in, uh, in this um, pathway in S. pyogenes, and came to the idea that maybe uh, tracer RNA uh, would um, have a role in the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And this is just because when you work with RNA molecules in bacteria, you know that there are some cis uh, or trans-located uh, uh, a regulatory RNA that can act in cis and trans. Uh, having said this, uh, this hypothesis revealed to be true, and what we showed, and this is the, the CRISPR-Cas9 pathway, in a first paper is that tracer RNA has a unique uh, feature to have an anti-repeat sequence, uh, allows, allowing it to best pair with the repeats of the long CRISPR RNA molecule, and that this forms a, a duplex uh, that will be uh, recognized, so stabilized by the protein Cas9, recognized by the enzyme RNA3, so the enzyme of, of the bacterial host, uh, that will uh, cleave this duplex of RNA molecules to form intermediate forms of, of CRISPR RNAs and tracer RNA. Uh, ultimately, there is a further processing event uh, taking place, and the final product uh, of interference, and this, uh, this is uh, the following uh, paper in, in science showing that uh, this uh, dual RNA, so the, the duplex between the CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA, remains uh, stable, uh, stabilized by Cas9, uh, to then act as um, the RNA guide uh, elements and that will guide this uh, Cas9 protein to the invading DNA. And uh, then Cas9 will, uh, will use uh, two nuclease domains to cleave each strand of the DNA molecule. So the fact that Cas9 and, uh, would cleave the DNA using two nuclease domains were hypothesized by, by informaticians and also showed by our colleagues, uh, the group of, of six NIS. But the idea of really tracer RNA being involved in, in the complex was uh, obviously um, coming from, uh, from the understanding that tracer RNA is really essential uh, for the system uh, to work. And then ultimately what Cas9 is doing, it does what zinc finger nucleases and talon nucleases uh, do. They, uh, these proteins introduce uh, double-stranded DNA embryos on, on the genome in a, in a blunt fashion. And the idea was to surely uh, reprogram the system to have uh, an already programmable um, enzyme and to simplify uh, the, the nature of this duplex of RNA by adding a linker and having a single guide RNA uh, that uh, would be uh, able to, so that the biologists would be able to program and to uh, allow the engineering of, of Cas9 for multiple purposes. So we showed that actually it's working, uh, it was working uh, very well and since for sure as you know, it has uh, started this field of uh, called CRISPR craze or this, this uh, really boom um, and this is a paper that was just published um, uh, actually a year after we, we showed uh, how to, to design uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system for the purpose of genome engineering. And, and already at that time, the technology was shown to be very successful to work in human cells, in mice, in, in different model organisms and in plants. Um, so Surely the enzyme, as I said, does the break, the rest is done by, by the cells and depending on whether one brings an homology donor in the cell or, 
or whether one relies just on, uh, on uh, the, the activity of the non-homologous engineering repair mechanisms, one can introduce smaller or larger indels on, uh, on the genome at the site of, of the break. So introduce a mutation, replace a mutation, if one uses uh, homologous uh, directed recombination, one can do some knock-ins. So a, a large variety of, of uh, modification. Uh, the advantages of the technology compared to the technologies that were available um, before CRISPR-Cas9 is that, okay, it's cheaper and e easier than zinc finger nucleases and talon nucleases that were costly at, at the time when CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, started in, um, in the market. Having said this, uh, an enzyme that is very efficient, uh, the, the beauty of, of the nature of this um, dual RNA guided nucleases is that allowed uh, uh, scientists to really develop uh, the technologies in multiple fashion, taking into account uh, the nature of these uh, two nuclease domains. And the fact also that one uh, could apply multiplexing, meaning uh, using uh, multiple guide RNAs to uh, modify uh, different genes at, at once. And a lot, a lot of efforts have been done over the last uh, six seven years now, to improve the specificity of the system, uh, to also improve the, the delivery uh, of the system according to uh, the, the, the size of, of, of the protein and according to, for sure, the, the different ways to deliver either the, um, the RNPs or uh, to deliver the, the DNA encoding um, the system. And surely efforts to try uh, to favor uh, homologous directed recombination of uh, non-homologous uh, engineering repair mechanisms in certain types of cells. This is actually a very old slide, but <laughs> to show that very fast, uh, the, the, the interesting aspect of Cas9 was this um, two nuclease domains and the possibility to, to have Cas9 as an RNA programmable uh, dead Cas9 uh, to which uh, scientists could uh, fuse different uh, effector domains uh, such as domains that can activate transcription or inhibit transcription, and you have a lot of uh, RNA, uh, uh, so CRISPR activation screens and CRISPR inhibition screens that have been developed, and also the possibility to study the epigenetic marks, and uh, also the, the possibility to label the DNA. And, and since then, uh, scientists, as I said, have really combined uh, this CRISPR-Cas technology with uh, former technologies and genetics to have this uh, versatile uh, toolbox that is very helpful. What I like very much is the fact that uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology uh, comes and other types of, of CRISPR-Cas uh, uh, systems now harnessed for also genetic engineering. Really, uh, all these CRISPR-Cas systems come from a long, <laughs> long evolution of of Bacta and Archaea in, in the, their world where they, their life is, is, is very difficult and they have to fight a lot of stresses, and including uh, the constant arms race with, with phages and, and viruses that are, uh, with regard to phages of, of, of Bacta, the most abundant population on the planet. And it's really a largely ev evolving system and, and allowing to, to develop this, uh, this wonderful uh, diversity of, of CRISPR-Cas uh, mechanisms and allowing to somehow uh, provide a tool that uh, allows to study or to facilitate uh, the, the study at the genetic uh, level of a large diversity of, of cells and organisms with which it was maybe a little bit cumbersome to do genetics prior to CRISPR-Cas9. So, and this is important because we work always with model organisms, but often these are not the right models. Or if you uh, refer to uh, medically oriented uh, research, one likes to work with really models that are relevant for the clinical uh, situation. And as much as a lot of primary human cells are, are, are not specifically easy to, to engineer due to the, to the cumbersomeness of, of the delivery systems. And nevertheless, uh, CRISPR-Cas has, has uh, facilitated uh, the genetics in, in certain of, of types of, of those cells. So everyone agrees to say that 
at least CRISPR-Cas9 brings an additional tool that is valuable to understand gene functions and to understand biology in health and diseases and in other types of life science uh, questions. So to rewire biological pathways to also having the possibility to develop better models for human diseases. With regard to medicine and health, the possibility to develop the technology for potential cure for genetic diseases, also the possibility to use the technology to engineer uh, CAR T cells for cancer immunotherapy and different aspects of, of drug development where the technology also is uh, useful to develop screens for new therapeutics and, as I said, uh, develop um, better models to test uh, the therapeutics uh, and uh, development. It's also a huge asset for the agriculture field, specifically with regard to using the technology to engineer uh, clean plant crops. So you have a, a lot of, of um, stakeholders which have, in a way, uh, taken this uh, technology for their advantages. And so uh, I think it's a it's, um, great advancement in, of different aspects in, in biotechnology and biomedical um, research. Um, having said this, the, the, I would like to finish my talk showing that the evolution is really important of the system. And for us, it has been key. Because very early on, uh, when we understood that tracer RNA was interacting with the CRISPR-Cas9 system through interaction between an anti-repeat sequence of the tracer RNA with a repeat sequence of the CRISPR RNA, we were a little bit puzzled initially because we had found that when we were blasting these tracer RNAs in s -pyogenes, we were always coming up with tracer RNAs of strep -pyogenes. So these RNA molecules had no homology with other RNA molecules whatsoever with anything on the, on the other, other genomes. And then we understood that the particularity of this family of RNA molecules is to have an anti-repeat sequence. The rest of, of the sequence of trace RNA is uh, hyper-variable. And for sure, the repeat sequences of the CRISPR-Cas9 systems are present in, uh, in bacteria, and this CRISPR-Cas9 system is only present in 5% of, of the bacteria, the repeat sequences are also extremely variable. Uh, the sequence of Cas9 is also extremely variable. You have the domains uh, involved in cleaving the DNA and the arginine rich motif that is conserved, but, and PAM sequences, uh, the PAM domains recognizing the PAM sequences that are also uh, largely uh, diverse among the different Cas9 proteins. You have Cas9 proteins that are big and shorter, so a large diversity, and, and the fact to, to somehow understand very early on that this um, uh, particularity of this interaction of the RNAs was a repeat anti repeat allowed us to look into the, the different genomes of bacteria having this CRISPR Cas9 system and to understand right away uh, the diversity and to have really uh, the, the, the assurance that we were understanding uh, the mechanism and that uh, this was uh, yeah, an, an, a Cas9 uh, guided with uh, a dual RNA uh, structure. Uh, so a, a lot of um, uh, scientists have also worked with smaller versions of Cas9 that are more amenable for uh, delivery systems. And so you have a lot of efforts that are done with regard to not only for the Cas9 system, but other CRISPR-Cas systems that are developed for genetic engineering to really look at the diversity of the bacterial world to, to find the, the Cas protein that is the most efficient and the most uh, amenable for for the genetic that one would like to do with uh, or his own cells and organisms of interest, but also a lot of protein uh, engineering, taking into account uh, the different um, characteristics of all this um, large panel of, of proteins. Now, what is very interesting to mention is that if you think that CRISPR-Cas elements are only involved in adaptive immunity of pattern archaea against um, viral infection is not the case. You have other functions of CRISPR-Cas systems, such as also a function in virulence, and this, this is the case of, of tracer RNA in Francisella novicida, and that together with an, another RNA that uh, contains a, a degenerated repeat of, of CRISPR RNA that is called SCAR RNA, can actually uh, target uh, the, the DNA encoding uh, messenger RNAs and proteins involved in, in virulence on Francisella novicida. And in this case, the targeting uh, affects ultimately the expression of virulence factors that allow Francisella novicida 
to evade uh, the recognition by the human uh, innate uh, immune system. So a very nice connection between a system which uh, initially was an adaptive immune system in bacteria that have evolved to then uh, interact with the machinery of Francisella novicida uh, to uh, allow it to, to interact differently with, uh, with another type of uh, innate immune system that is uh, in humans, so upon interaction between the bacteria and the human also. It's largely complex. Now, for sure, since the type 2 system, other simple CRISPR-Cas systems have been um, highlighted. Uh, we have worked on CPF1, we worked on others, and I'm sure that uh, Feng will also present his work on, on uh, the other uh, minimal CRISPR-Cas uh, systems that can target DNA or RNA. So a large diversity of mechanisms, so for sure, uh, Macrobiologists are very excited to try to sequence everything uh, in the planet to try to find even new types of CRISPR-Cas that could lead to new, um, new uh, uh, genetic engineering technologies. And you have also, I will finish it here, I mean, biologists, CRISPR biologists continuing to understand the, the details of the mechanisms also with regard to special acquisition. But for example, in Israel, you have also the group of Rotem Sorek that has uh, published also um, last year new new defense systems existing in procurers that could lead to also new ways to, to increase this toolbox for genetic engineering. Um, as I said, we work on other mechanisms in, in the lab. I hope that one day we will have uh, the possibility to my, I will have the possibility to tell you uh, the other aspects of, of the research. Um, so it's always in the context of interaction with mobile genetic elements, but also uh, the human host and looking at uh, different types of, of uh, proteins interacting with RNA, DNA, and also uh, globally post-transcriptional and post-translational um, um, regulation of, of gene expression. Uh, if you are interested in joining my team, uh, do not hesitate to contact me. Again, the institutions and uh, my collaborators and the people who did the work, this is my team. And this is a structure of, of the research institute that I have co-founded recently with different uh, research platforms that are very helpful to help us with uh, our research. And I would like to thank also um, the co-founders of, of CRISPR Therapeutics and ERS Genomics, Sean Foy and, and Rodger Novak, and I would like to thank you for your attention.